I remember well back in 1995 when Mr. Gary Petty stood in front of us and the crowd was, as I recall, between 330 and 340. And he stated, he said, Headquarters has asked me to announce that it is no longer necessary to observe the Seventh-day Sabbath and it's no longer necessary to tithe. And I looked around the room and there were an awful lot of grins on faces. The reason that I haven't ever presented this sermon is because I said to myself, if I'm going to offer four pocket keys to enduring, why would I do it to the ones or for the ones who have endured? But then in Matthew 24, we read that people are actually going to betray one another when the end comes. So, okay, I thought, you know, if I can give people something they can just stick in their pocket and can remember, because that's what we're going to do. We're going to have four that we can remember, three in particular, and then the fourth one becomes more automatic. So that's my goal today, brother, to give you four pocket keys to enduring. Key number one is that we can never compare ourselves to a human being. We have to always compare ourselves to God. Back in the late 70s, or thereabouts, you may recall there was a nation named Rhodesia. Today it's called Zimbabwe. There was quite a hadoo back then about how there should be a change in government. And I guess what made me think of this was that just this past week, I pulled out a National Geographic. You know, you never throw National Geographics away. And it reminded me because there was an article on this nation and what's happened to it over the past 40 years. In the words of National Geographic, the leader of the nation has been at war with his people for all this time. Now, my understanding is he began sharing power a couple of years ago. At one point, inflation was over a million percent a year. People were in desperate straits. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and take a look at 2 Corinthians 10, please. <clears throat> there was a time when the leader of the nation was asked if he knew how desperate things had become in his nation. And he said, I can think of at least four other nations, maybe even five, that are as bad off as we are. Now, when you consider there are any, somewhere between 189 and 195 nations, depending on who we ask, I guess that that sounds not so bad. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12 says, We dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. You don't have to turn here, but in Isaiah 40, verse 18, it says, to whom then will you liken God? So key number one is we cannot compare ourselves to another human being. We have to compare ourselves or we should compare ourselves to God. Pocket key number two. If we work for men, we can easily become offended. If we work for God, this isn't going to happen. Many, many years back, <laughs> I was rather new in the church. I was up at the Dells. There were about 12,000 people, as I recall. There was to be, after services, some sort of a get-together where people were going to be seating at tables, tables like we see here, eight-foot tables. At that time, the work that I was doing was a commercial cleaning service where I had one account where I would set up about 25 to 30 of these tables. Well, I'm going to say every other week. And I'd do it early in the morning on Sunday, and by the early in the morning I meant probably between 4 and 5.30 in the morning. Well, for me, setting up tables was nothing. So after services, I ran over to where the tables were, set up about 25 tables, and all of a sudden there was a young man standing next to me. And when I say young man, I want to emphasize he was young then compared to me. Uh, he looked at me and he said, By what authority have you set up these tables? I was offended. Now, what do you mean by what authority? I know you need these tables. We just have to carry them to wherever they go, which wasn't far. It was a small distance. You know, in the third chapter of the book of Acts, Peter, walking with others, comes upon a, a man who had been lame from birth. He was lame from the womb, according to the New King James Bible. And he asked for money. 
And Peter said, I don't have any money to give you, but God then healed the man through by using Peter. In the fourth chapter of Acts, some of the religious leaders came to Peter and they asked him, by what authority have you healed this man? And I say, if we work for men, we can become offended. I don't care if we're working in sound, working in the kitchen, working in setup, whatever we do, we are working for God. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. This is the work we're doing, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We work for God. We do not work for men. Pocket key number three. We should never blame God for our circumstances. However, we should always look to God for deliverance. That only makes sense. Let's look at 2 Timothy. These are some of my favorite verses coming up. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. And we'll start in verse 1. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 1. Paul, writing to Timothy, says, Therefore, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me uh, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship, interesting, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles him with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Let's drop down to verse 8, please. Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of the seed of David, was raised from the dead, according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. He makes an interesting point. Doing the work of God is an opportunity, even though he had to suffer for it. Pocket key number four. The lifelong comparison is the lifelong comparison is between hanging on and trusting God and letting go when the going gets tough. I have a simple analogy of a helicopter dropping a ladder down to someone who's in a swampy bog or wherever, whatever kind of trouble they're in. When you grab hold of that ladder that came down, you got to hang on because it's going to pull you up. And if you let go, you're going to be in worse condition than you were. Pick it up right away in verse 10 where we were. Therefore, Paul says, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, there's that word again, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers. These are four pocket keys, and I've called them keys simply because we carry our keys in our pocket. And you can pull them out easily. There are three things that we have to remember, really. If we do that, the fourth one is going to be an automatic. Number one is we never compare ourselves to a human being. We compare ourselves to God. Number two, we work for God. If we're working for a man, we we'll become offended. Number three, we never blame God when times get tough. But we do turn to God always when they do. In other words, we work for God. We compare ourselves with God. And we turn to God whenever there's a problem. And if we do those three, brethren, the fourth one, which is hanging on throughout our life and never letting go, becomes an automatic. 